right, guys, let's get started. We're a little bit late tonight, so we're going to jump right into it. How was dinner? Good. Good, good, good. We'll have these other folks coming in as soon as they uh, get done putting things away out there, I guess. I have a volcano behind me because we're having uh, VBS here at our church, and they've worked so hard to make this beautiful set, so we're going to leave it up here for about six months. I'll start where yeah, I'm going to wear a fire suit on Sunday, so yeah, or maybe a, maybe a Hawaiian shirt. Feel like I'm in the tropics or something up here, right? So, anyway. Well, how's it going? Glad to hear it. Why don't you open up your Bibles with me to 1 Kings chapter 18. We have a pretty interesting uh, section tonight to look at. You all have probably read this story before, but uh, it's really good to uh, review these stories. God always has a message in them for us. There's no question about that. doesn't matter how many times we read these things. God always seems to show us something new. So last week, uh, oh, let me pray before we do anything. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for this opportunity just to be with my brothers and sisters here, um, to fellowship and study your word. God, thank you for your love, all your blessings that you've given to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you, Father, for sending your son that he would redeem us by his blood. Help us, Lord, to never, ever take that for granted. Just pray, God, you'd keep our hearts soft before you. Lord, you know the world out there just has a way of trying to make us hard. And we know that you want us to be people of compassion and love. So, Holy Spirit, we just ask that you would be here with us this evening and rest upon our hearts. Be in our thoughts. Show us what you want us to see in these words tonight as we read them. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So, um, last week we looked at this story where um, Elijah had helped this widow and her son after he announced that it would not rain in uh, in that area out there. There was a drought. It was very severe. And uh, we we got, we we learned several lessons from chapter 17 last, uh, last week. Verse 24 in chapter 17 is where I want to start to help put things into context here a little bit. It says that the woman said to Elijah, By this I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in, in your mouth is the truth. Now, how did she know that it was the truth? Well, she had seen God working right in front of her, didn't she? She saw her son raised from the dead. She saw provisions made by the Lord to keep them from starving to death. But it wasn't until her son died and Elijah brought him back to life that she was sold, if you will, on the idea that this guy really is a prophet. He really does speak the truth. Now, we don't know how long he stayed there with her. Um, We know that this famine... Lasted about three years, three and a half years, I think, or three years. So we picked the story up, and uh, the very first verse really is interesting to me because it says that it came to pass 
after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. You know, I think sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we really don't have a sense of chronology. We don't have a timeline in our mind. We just see one cool thing happen after another. Every chapter brings something new, but we don't really consider how much time may go by between one verse and even the very next verse. There could be hundreds of years that would go by, or a few years, or a month, or a day. Um, It's hard for us to know, but I think in our minds we kind of get this idea that back in those days, every day God was doing something cool, you know? Uh, There's another passage in the Bible that, that tells us that during this particular specific time, um, that the word of the Lord was rare in Israel. Which really speaks to me, because sometimes we go through these droughts spiritually, don't we? We go through these times where we want to hear from the Lord, and, it, and it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not working. We're praying, and you ever pray, and you just feel kind of dried up, and you just you know, going through the motions kind of a thing, and uh, we can become weary spiritually, but we need to understand that it's okay, it's normal for sometimes for God to be silent. It's okay. Um, I know that when we have our prayer meeting and there's those periods of time when no one is praying, and it's just silent, and you almost feel like, I need to do something. I need to, I need to get, so, I need to fill in the time. It's, you know, nobody's doing anything. But then we find out down the road a little bit, th- those quiet times are awesome. We need them. We need to be able to just, when we're praying, we need to just be able to sit here in silence sometimes before God. Be still and know that I am the Lord, Right? And the world that we live in, it's really hard to be still. I wish more folks could appreciate coming in here on a, a, a nice evening and being able to just forget about all that stuff out there for a while and just sit before God and be still. Maybe not even say a word. Maybe just soaking it in. Maybe listening more than talking. Um, You know, I think sometimes people get this idea that when we do pray, it's like a drive-thru at Burger King or something, you know. Uh, We're just going to do the drive-thru. I want everything supersized, you know. Um, It doesn't work. It's not that way. Um, We want to have not just our requests going out, but even during these times of silence, when the word of the Lord is rare, when we don't feel like we're hearing from God, those are the times when I think that rather than talking so much, he would have us to just sit and wait. And we see that here in these very first words of chapter 18. And here's another little play on words. And I love this, because it's all through the Bible. It came to pass... So we get this idea when it says it came to pass that it means something happened. It came. But when I read this, I heard a pastor one time say, he's talking about our circumstances sometimes. When we view this, everything came to pass. Whatever you're going through is going to pass. It came to pass. Even our own lives are going to pass, right? And I think that's kind of a comforting thought because... God forbid that we should be suffering forever and ever. It came. It's here. We embrace it. We trust the Lord in the middle of it. And we also know at the same time, it's going to pass. It's going to be over someday. And we'll, we'll, we'll move on. So Elijah here, we don't know how much, well, about three years it would appear uh, in the third year. God spoke to Elijah. All that time there was, there was quiet. He said, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. 
So the crops are dead. They can't feed their livestock. There's no fresh water. Um, things are bad. Things are rough. After three years of no rain, you can imagine how, uh, how much they were suffering. Uh, water was a very um, rare commodity during this time. I'm sure there was a lot of nasty behavior going on, people who were greedy and stealing from one another. And, you know, that's how people get during tough times. Um, so finally, finally, it did begin to pass. It was time for it to pass. And so it was time for Elijah to go to Ahab. Now, Ahab is the king, and he's not a good guy. He's a bad king. He's a really wicked, wicked man. And he has led Israel, the whole nation, and, and down a path of sin and wickedness and darkness. That's why the drought's happening, right? Because of their sin. We can't expect that living water splash all over me when I'm living in sin. It's not going to happen. We wonder, some people wonder why God's not blessing my life. Well, take a little bit closer look at your life. Maybe you'll discover why. Well, I've got the Christian brand. I got a dove on my shirt, you know. Well, what's in your heart? What's in the shirt, <laughs> right? That's what's really important. What's going on? And where is your relationship? Well, this... This whole country had moved away from God, much like our country has today. We are so amazingly paralleled with Israel in its history and in what we're going through right now in our country. It's amazing. And because our country also was founded on godly principles. It was never perfect, but at least... We, we had a, a, a nation that believed in the true God. And now you get in trouble for, seems like, for believing in God or Jesus, if you will. We don't want to use that word. It's offensive, the name of Jesus. I will shout that from the rooftops forever and ever, right? I don't care what they do. But he tells Elijah, and I'm sure with Elijah, he knows what's going on. He spoke the word of the Lord to them. He doesn't like this king. And I'm sure he would just like to see a lightning bolt come down and fry this dude and be done with it. If God would have told me and say, I want you to go to Ahab and I'm going to send rain on the earth. I'd say, what? This guy's wicked, Lord. I don't even want to see him. I don't even want to talk to him. And they don't deserve rain. But God is merciful, isn't he? He's merciful. So, go present yourself to Ahab, and I'll send rain on the earth. So Elijah went. He was obedient to present himself to Ahab. And we have this little footnote. There was a severe famine in Samaria. The whole area was dried up. So Ahab had called Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. He was the overseer, if you will, um, of the king's house. And Obadiah was one of the very, very few people who still feared the Lord, who still loved God. It says that right here, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. Think about this. Think about the house he's living in, the environment that he's living in. Look at verse 4. And so it was, while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord, that'll give you a little clue, that Obadiah had taken 100 of the prophets and hidden them away. He put 50 of them in two caves, 50 each, and fed them. And he managed to feed them with bread and water during this whole three-year period during this famine. God 
protected these prophets, these 100 prophets that Obadiah uh, stashed away, hid from Jezebel, because she killed all the other ones. That's what the devil does. He comes to kill, to steal, to destroy, to divide. So Obadiah is living in a place <clears throat> that is the most ungodly environment that you can imagine with this witch, Jezebel. Not much to be praising God about, but yet this man remained faithful. He continued feeding these people, taking care of them, hiding them, and so Jezebel was feared among all the people. Even Ahab, her own husband, was scared to death of this lady. So verse 5 says, Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks, and perhaps we might find grass to keep the horses and mules alive so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they're desperate now. They're just looking for little patches somewhere where there might be a little underground trickle still going on, you know. Uh, and, they're, and they're in search. So you got the king himself, and you got Obadiah, this really godly man. These are the two guys that are going to go in search of these little Spots of grass in the land. It says in verse 6, they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way by himself. Obadiah, he went another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him. And he recognized him. And he fell on his face and he said, is that you, my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, he said, it is I. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. Now you would think Obadiah would be going, awesome, I can't wait to tell the king that you're here. And, but no, that's not what happens here. Obadiah is terrified. Obadiah is afraid to go tell the king about Elijah. In verse 9, he asked the question, how have I sinned? Or what have I done wrong? What have I done to you? Why are you setting me up, basically? That you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me. Why, for delivering a telegram? I mean, you would think it's just a small thing. But Obadiah, he's like, he's going to kill me. Why are you doing this to me, Elijah? And as the Lord God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he's not there, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. And so now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. They looked everywhere for him. And he threatened all these little villages and kingdoms that were in the, in the surrounding area uh, to swear that they weren't hiding Elijah somewhere. Verse 12, it will come to pass, there it is again, as soon as I am gone from you, that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place that I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab and he can't find you, he's going to kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. I'm a man of God. I've been walking with the Lord in the midst of all of this wickedness and sin. Why would you send me to the slaughter like that, Elijah? Verse 13, was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid 100 men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave, and fed them with bread and water. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah's here. He will kill me. 
And then Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. And Ahab went to meet Elijah. We have this great conflict coming together here. We have the epitome of evil versus the man of God coming together. Darkness and light coming together. So it happened in verse 17. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, and he said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all of Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So we got 850 of these devil worshipers, if you will, idol worshipers that worship Baal, the Baals, if you will. There are many, we talked about that I think last week, there are many of them, some 25, 30 different Baal gods, and then of course Asherah, um, the uh, the fertility uh, goddess there. And so he summons all the people and gathers them together on Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and he said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. But the people answered him, not a word. They were silent. Nobody would say anything. Nobody would stand up for the God of Israel. It just kind of gives you an indication how, what condition they were in spiritually. Not one person stood up and said, Jehovah's God, right? Not one. So Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull. And I will lay it on the wood. And I will put no fire under it. So you got them with their bull. They slaughter it. All the idol worshipers and the false prophets are putting, you know, kindling under there. Getting ready to set it up so they can build a fire. And over here, here's Elijah. And he's by himself. And he's killing this bull. And he's doing the same thing. He's setting the stage here for a contest. Now... One of the things that uh, drew my attention was Elijah didn't try to sacrifice his bull on their altar. He made his own, separate from theirs. And we're going to see why in a few minutes. He says, I'll prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood but put no fire under it. And then you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. I'll call Jehovah. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And so all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. This is going to be great. I think they actually believed that their false God was going to answer them. But you know, we read about it in the New Testament that 
idols, and it's even in the Old Testament, they don't see. They don't see you. They can't hear you. They can't speak. They're stone or they're wood. And you're raising them up and exalting them into this place of uh, wonder when they can do absolutely nothing to help you. Now, I say that in, in the sense that of the physical idols that they built. But here's something important that we should know. I think also there was a spirit behind these idols. That spirit was real. That demonic entity was real. So it wasn't so much the statue, it was what the statue represented. That's just wood. It can't talk, can't see, can't hear. But what it represents is what we worship. We worship a living Savior. So the people said, okay, let's go for it. Let's see what happens. I'm sure they're not too happy with Elijah at this point because, after all, he's the one that called down the drought on them, and they've been suffering through that for three years now. So Elijah, in verse 25, said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bowl for yourselves, prepare it first, for you are many. There's a lot of you guys. shouldn't be that hard for you. But don't put any fire. So they took the bowl which was given them and prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal. From the morning until noon. 6 a.m. to 12. Six hours. We have a hard time praying for 40 minutes. They're out there for six hours. Crying out. To Baal. We even know what they're saying. Oh, Baal, hear us. Silence. There was no voice. No one answered. And now they're panicking. And they're wondering what is going on. And they leaped around the altar. They started... Dancing around the altar, this crazy dances around the altar as they're screaming out to try to get Baal to hear them. And so it was at noon, Elijah had seen enough. Elijah started mocking them. I love this. Elijah says to them, cry louder, for he is a god. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. Now, this is kind of comical, but it's really sad at the same time when you think about it. But when it says he's busy, <laughs> you could literally translate that and say, maybe he's using the bathroom. He's busy. Or he's on a journey. Or he's meditating. Sleeping. Aren't you glad that our God does not nap on the job? Right? He's always there for us. And maybe he must be awakened, Elijah said. So cry louder. Jump higher. As a matter of fact, start cutting yourselves. So they did in verse 28. They cried louder and they cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. Can you imagine? There's 450 of these guys. Wow, chaos, total chaos. This whole idea, cutting yourself, that is so wicked. It's so demonic. 
We have people today that have sometimes mental problems and they cut themselves. Now I know that for the most part, a lot of times when that happens, it's a cry for help. But there are those times once in a while when they do cut too deep and it takes their lives. These guys here, they're, they're doing the not so deep. They're just slashing themselves to let blood flow and they're making a literally a blood offering sacrifice to their God as the blood is gushing out of them. Now when midday had passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. I think the people are starting to become disenchanted with their Baals. They're waiting. The whole population is there at the mountain watching this, waiting for their God to do something. To call fire down from heaven. To light the wood that was underneath the sacrifice. So Elijah, he let it go on probably till about six o'clock. A time that they would normally typically have an evening sacrifice And finally, Elijah spoke up and he said to all the people, come near to me. So all the people came near to him. Their hearts are starting to change here. They're starting to lose confidence in their false god. You know, sometimes like Obadiah, we can feel... Like we're stuck with no allies. We could feel like we're so surrounded by wickedness. Obadiah must have been quite an individual to remain faithful during all of this. And people, you hate to say this about us, people, but we are so fickle. We'll put our allegiance on something one minute and then we'll stab them in the back the next minute. If it doesn't go my way, I'll discard it and move on. And that's how people are. I think that's part of that flesh life that we live, that in the world life, that lust of the eyes and the flesh and the pride of life that exists in us when we come into this world. But finally, I think these people are now beginning to say, hey, something's going on. Maybe we've been duped. Maybe we've been lied to. They've been putting on a show for us all this time. And we've been scared to death of this woman and her priests, her prophets, So all the people came near to Elijah. Now, look at this little phrase here. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Why do you suppose it was broken down? Because all them Baal worshipers knocked it down. They couldn't stand to look at the altar of Jehovah. They had to knock it down. So Elijah takes 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name, governed by God. That's a real good translation of that word, Israel. Their nation at one time was governed by God. So was ours. But they had abandoned that. 
It's interesting because <clears throat> Jacob, Jacob had some serious issues. Jacob was kind of a little tattletale when he was little. You know, he was kind of a snitch. He's kind of a mama's boy. He wasn't liked by his other brothers. He was kind of a, a con man, if you will. And when Israel would misbehave, he would refer to them as Jacob. When they would repent, he would refer to them as Israel. Very interesting uh, thing to ponder there. So with the stones, Elisha built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two shears of seed. Don't know how much that is. If you have a footnote in your Bible, it tells you I'd like to know. How much? Four gallons of seed. And he put the wood in order. He cut the bull in pieces, and he laid it on the wood, and he said, fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice, and on the wood. So his little assistants there are literally pouring water, which is a very precious commodity. I might be standing in there in the crowd going... What are they wasting all that water for? Just save a canteen full for us or something, right? So they're pouring this water on the bull, on the carcass. They're pouring it all over the wood. They're pouring it in this little trench that was uh, carved out. And then in verse 34, he said, do it again. And so they did it a second time. <laughs> he says... Do it again, a third time. So they did it a third time. There was so much water that the water ran all around the altar that he had made, and he filled the trench with water. Now I would imagine at this point the people are watching him do this, thinking he is a loony tune, right? How does he think by any means that his God is going to overcome what, what's going on here. And so the water ran around the trench, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, which was a, it was a holy time. It was a time that they were to make their sacrifices to the Lord. that Elijah the prophet, he came near, and he said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and look, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all of these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. I love that. It was a process, though, wasn't it? The lie had been exposed. Something wonderful was about to happen. The people's hearts were broken. They were dying of thirst. They were frustrated. Their gods had let them down. Their hearts were ready. And then the fire of the Lord fell and it consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench and when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, the Lord Jehovah, he is God. The Lord is God. 
What a revival. What an awesome moment to see thousands of people literally fall on their faces. To see this great miracle of this fire coming down. Even, I love the wording here, it licked up the water. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? It licked up the water that was in the trench. They realized, you know, it took a lot. That was no small thing. That was a heavy-duty demonstration of God's power. Sometimes it takes a lot for us to believe, too. Sometimes we can be pretty boneheaded, I think, when it comes to trust in the Lord. And even I can think, like, you know, even before walking with the Lord, before knowing God, how boneheaded people could be, including myself. It took something powerful to cause me to fall on my face before God. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you have experienced that. It's like everything that you've known, everything you trusted in, everything that you hoped for is dashed. It's gone. It's destroyed. You have nothing. You're broken. And you're thinking, God would never, ever accept me back again. I don't know if you guys have ever thought that or not. Some of you who have been prodigals in your life, you've probably wandered around out there at times thinking, ha, I bet I've just gone too far. I'll bet I've used up all of his forgiveness. I'm doomed, right? But then God brings that fire down from heaven, from our lives, into our lives and we fall on our face before him. And we become brand new people. Look at one of the first things they had to deal with, though, after this wonderful revival. They had spiritual warfare to deal with. Immediately. They didn't all go home and make a little campfire and sing praise songs around the fire that night. They went to war. So Elijah said, verse 40, seize the prophets of Baal. That's 450 of them. It's a lot of people. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon, and he executed them there. Now, I'd like to think that maybe Elijah had some help. Right? He must have had some assistance because that's a lot of sword swinging. 450 people to execute. You know, you clean your house, you repent, you ask God to forgive you, but you're holding on to something that you should let go of. You've let him, we've let him in our hearts and we've said, okay, Lord, you can come into my home. You can go anywhere you want except in that room. There's a lock on that door. I got the key. That's the only place you can't go. Do not let one of these prophets survive. Don't let one of those things continue to remain in your house, in your heart. So Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink. For is, there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink. Elijah went up to the top of Carmel and then he bowed down on the ground and he put his face between his knees he said to his servants go up now look toward the sea so he went up and he looked and he said 
there is nothing. And seven times he said, go again. It came to pass on the seventh time that he said, hey, there's a little cloud out there. As small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. And so he said, go up and say to Ahab, prepare your chariot (laughs) and go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind and there was heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and he went to Jezreel. And then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah And he girded up his loins, and he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. I'm going to park it right there. It's a good place to stop. Jezebel has lost all of her little followers They've all been slaughtered. And Elijah was there to witness this unbelievable, miraculous miracle. And then following that, this great cleansing. Getting rid of the evil. Dispatching it, if you will. But we're going to find out next week. Perhaps Elijah wasn't all that after all, right? Perhaps he was just a man. Perhaps he was subject to the same kinds of things that we are afraid of sometimes. So we'll continue this next week when we move into chapter 19. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord that you hear us when we pray. Help us to tear down our altars. Help us, Lord, to clean our house. Help us to have open ears that we might hear. And give us power in your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might accomplish what you have called us for. We thank you that we live during this time in history, that it's not an accident that you've placed us here at this time, that we know that you've called us, that you have special plans for us to accomplish your will. So Holy Spirit, we look to you to empower us, remind us, Comfort us and strengthen us, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.